Hello, it's uh, Paul Beckwith. I'm with the uh, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology at the uh, University of Ottawa. And um, right now I'm standing on um, Rock Dundar, which is uh, it's a, um, it's a very old uh, volcanic uh, uh, craton um, or pluton. So it's a volcanic, uh, an internal um, volcanic intrusion that has come up and then uh, reach the surface and uh, so it's basically one huge rock feature. Um, so what I want to talk about today is some um, very important uh, carbon dioxide uh, removal methods. Um, it goes without saying that we have to uh, slash emissions, go on to a emergency program to slash emissions and retool our society with renewables, but that's not good enough. We have to do two additional things. We have to cool the Arctic to restore the uh, stability of the jet streams. Um, and we also have to do, undertake um, programs in carbon dioxide removal so that the CO2 levels, which have risen from 280 parts per million um, in 1750 or so um, to over 400 parts per million now, we have to remove those to at least 350 or lower to uh, get back to a uh, stable um, climate system, a stable weather, have stable weather patterns. So um, we have to cool the Arctic to restore the thermodynamic balance between the equator and the Arctic, uh, but that's not sufficient. We also have to withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere. Obviously reducing um, deforestation is a very um, important component of that. Um, and actually large planting programs of trees to absorb uh, CO2 is very important. But what, we're, what we're, we're going the other way big time. I mean, we're seeing massive forest fires in Alaska, for example, that are burning deep down into the permafrost, it's, um, melting the, allowing the permafrost to be melted, not just for the heat of the fire, but because there's no insulation material on top. Um, and also the soils are blackened and that absorbs a lot of solar energy causing heating and uh, you know it's another one of these cascading feedbacks. So we're going completely the wrong direction right now. Um, but the oceans cover 71% of the surface. The oceans absorb huge amounts of CO2 uh, but as the water temperature increases that CO2 uh, sink um, decreases because warm water cannot dissolve as much uh, gas including CO2 as cold water can. So as we warm the oceans, um, they're absorbing less CO2. Um, thus, there's more, more of our emissions end up in the atmosphere. So it's, like I said, it's all heading south right now. Um, so one of the, so let's look at the oceans. Let's look at life on the planet, for example. Uh, about 400 years ago, if you take the biomass of the planet today, so if you take all the plants and all the animals on the entire surface of the Earth um, and you weigh them, um, you'll get a very large number, but that number is very small compared to what it was, say, 400 years ago. In fact, uh, 400 years ago, we probably had something like anywhere in the range from two to six times as much biomass um, as we have today. So with all that extra biomass, um, there was a lot more carbon in the, um, in the environment tied up in the flora and fauna. And that carbon, um, for example, we've lost about 90% of the large marine species in the ocean. Um, the whales, um, for whales and uh, large fish, over 90%. Think of how much carbon would be in that. And for, with a large whale, it's a crucial part of the ecosystem because it's eating the krill and the phytoplankton and zooplankton on the surface, and then it's descending and it's excrement, and then it's, it sinks to the bottom of nutrients, and then they're recycled. So we've lost all of this. So what we need to do, so what I'll talk about today is a method uh, that Seb Clark has developed uh, with Drew Pierce and others, um, some AMEG people, I think methane emergency group people, and it's talking, it's, the idea is to use, is to make the ocean vibrant with life again. Um, hundred, a few hundred years ago, literally you could almost walk across the surface of the sea because it was teeming with, with life teeming with fish, teeming with life, and there's lots of carbon um, in, in that. So basically what Seb Clark's method is, is to use these buoyant aerosol flakes, so a rice-derived material, um, and you choke it with, you fill it with nutrients, because the limiting factor for life in the ocean is mostly nutrients. 
we, for example, iron, um, iron and um, nitrogen and sulfur. The problem is, is with plankton blooms, you get runoff of first of the first of these nutrients. You get a plankton bloom, and then it can't sustain itself. It dies. Um, the organic material sinks, is decomposed, causing dead zones on the ocean floor. So what you want is you want you want the nutrients to be available for a long period of time and to be slowly released. So this is the idea of these um, aerosol flakes. Um, the um, if you Google envisionation or look at some of my videos recently, um, you'll see some more, you'll find more information, or you can just ask me. But the idea is that you ha you manufacture these buoyant flakes and you put trace elements of the nutrients in them and they float around on the ocean for up to a year, to two, a, a, six months to a year, and they slowly release their nutrients. Then you spread them mostly um, in large parts of the ocean that are devoid of nutrients. Uh, for example, large, vast parts of the southern oceans are devoid of nutrients, and we know uh, that these flakes, which would re release, slowly release the nutrients, would cause a sustainable growth of phytoplankton then, then the, they're the base of the food chain, so then that would get the zooplankton and the larger fish and the larger fish and the larger fish, and then that would also remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So um, I think it's a very important, very, um, very good idea to start restoring some of the biomass on this planet, and it's a lot easier to do it um, in the vastness of the oceans as opposed to finding places on land to do it. Okay, thank you.